And so I designed a modem uh, in like 1973. I graduated in 72. We needed modems at uh, this community memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hanging out with people in the personal computer undergrad who were some pretty good engineers. And they were telling me, well, yeah, essentially, you only need to do this and that. And basically gave me the confidence to go ahead. And so I developed a circuit for that that was, in fact, more than adequate for the task, as well as a phase lock loop circuit, which has nothing to do with the uh, root locus technique. I have to qualify that statement. It had a little to do with it. But because I wanted the modem to be able to read data off of cassette tape, and I'd had four years learning what can go wrong with cassette tape, right. um, I realized that, <clears throat> okay, we have to have a variable reference. And we could do that if we paid attention to the data that was coming through. Now, when you design a modem, it has to be supposedly, what is it, ag agnostic about us to data. Data ag agnostic. That's the word I was going to use, yeah. So I violated that structure, and I said, we're going to be sending this thing asynchronous serial data. It will always return to marking condition, low level, between every character. And if we made it a reference that could swat it down and charge up on the capacitor, swat it down the next time, we could make it work. And we did. We made it work. Brilliant. This is the famous... Penny whistle one hundred three. Penny whistle oh, modem. Right. Yep. Why? Why was it the one hundred three? Because it was it, it, it met the Bell one hundred three standards. Oh, of course. Uh, Three hundred baud, uh, full duplex, and that's the one hundred three part. The penny whistle part is from my childhood in Philadelphia. Benjamin Franklin, the story of his wasting money on a penny whistle and being reproved for it, and therefore becoming very very penny pinching. We were all taught that in elementary school. Um, and I thought of the, the, the amateur radio term for a very low transmitter, low, low power transmitter was a peanut whistle. And so I figured, you know, I can call it, try calling it the peanut whistle, but nobody's going to understand that one. Peanut whistle, penny whistle, Ben Franklin. Okay, let's put that in there. It sounds more poetic. So that was the motive. Uh, and, it, and it was suitable for, for use as a kit because no adjustments, at least they, on, the, on yeah. the receiving it. There are adjustments in the transmitting it, but you could do that with an oscilloscope. <clears throat> so was this published? I can't remember. July four, July issue of Popular Electronics Magazine, 1976. That's right. That's our national bicentennial. So that drove down modem prices massively from $350 to $100. And I'm very proud of that. And Who I made money on it. Hmm? Sold as a kit. Who um, sold the kit? Was that you? Did you sell it directly? No, I didn't sell it. A guy named uh, Marty Spurgell, Martin J. Spurgell, M&R Enterprise. It was really just a kitchen table and garage operation on his part. He was selling kits of parts for popular electronic construction projects. And he was at the first meeting of the Homebrew Club. And he handed out a an 8008 processor chip to establish his bona fides. Um, and soon thereafter, he came to me and said, give me a computer to sell. Well, I didn't have a computer, but I had this modem, which I designed in 1973. And <clears throat> that was good enough for him. And it was a good project for him to start on. He, he, he found the rubber cups. He always considered himself the junk man. He knew where parts could be had do the social engineering to find these things. So it worked out very well for him and me. And he became quite wealthy, not from the modem, but because he was the only one who had the guts to risk selling RF modulators for TVs that would plug into Apple II computers. There was a place for them, but Apple wouldn't touch it. And Why not? Because of the regulatory problem. Uh, FCC was always contacting Marty Spurgell and saying, we have a complaint, dot, dot, dot. And he says, yeah, well, show me the complaint. And he fought back, pushed back on them. A company was going to play it safe, but he was just one man, one man and his wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made it go. 
uh, he was able to sell the super mod, S-U-P-R-M-O-D, which were yeah. modulators he bought in the Far East and was just reselling. Um, there wasn't much engineering or any engineering to them. But that was separate from me. I didn't get any money from that. He got the money and he made out very well and I'm very happy that he did. We needed terminals for community memory. We needed display terminals. And we tried renting one with a service contract and it turned out the service tech did not know what he was talking about. So we got very sour on that. That was September or thereabouts of 1973. And that day, in September, in Radio Electronics Magazine, a magazine aimed at radio and TV service technicians. Mm -hmm. An article appeared called The TV Typewriter by one Don Lancaster. Yes, Don, Don Lancaster, yes, classic. You, you say this was the start of the com personal computer revolution, possibly? I call it the opening shot of the personal computer revolution because the magazine couldn't, didn't want to waste space printing all the construction details, they figured only about 20 people would be interested in that. So have them send in a self-addressed stamped envelope and $2. And we'll send them, you know, go away, they'll come back. 10,000 people sent in their money. When you see that happening, you know there's a revolution underway. Yep. The promise of first-hand involvement in digital technology and video technology was irresistible. You could build something that would make you the master of your television, digitally, putting text up on the screen, impress your friends. And <laughs> of course you'd learn a great deal, much more than you actually knew you needed to learn about the, uh, about the two technologies, about digital, because it wasn't a very good design. I was going to say, yes, it's, isn't it famous for not being... It was full of analog timers. And, and difficult to get going. Right? Yes, it was very hard to get going. So you needed to really learn your way into that stuff. So anytime I ran, ran into anybody who had built one, I knew this guy knew his stuff. And they still told sold 10,000. <laughs> uh, they sold 10,000 sets of plants. They didn't send in, they didn't sell 10,000 units of anything because people had to build their own. I guess they were right. circuit boards you could buy. Yeah. Because the, what the, the schematic wasn't published, was it? Or something, or the, the actual, it wasn't a full construction article. It wasn't. Was it? That's the point. So you had to, you, so you're buying the plan. You buy the plans. And you got this big fold out sheet with a schematic on it. And, you know, I don't know what all else. I saw it, but I didn't want to see it. When the Altair was announced, and I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, it was the same thing. The, the electrification was palpable among people I ran into at radio stations and so forth. The, the uh, potential digital underground, which was analog at that point. Now, let's move back on. Where did I get to? Lancaster told me that uh, the next one he would do would include random access memory because his was designed around shift register memory, recirculating memory, little tiny chip, one input, one output. So it was a FIFO buffer, basically. Correct. First in, first out. Yes, right. First in, first out. Yes. It's a sequence of, of, of flip flops. And the data went around and around, and you had it, it was synchronized with the display of the raster, the beam on the screen that painted the image. And if you got everything right, you had counters upon counters. Uh, you would know when your next character was going to come up and you could input a character to it. It would disappear and come out one screen later and be available for input, which meant that if you're going to input a text character into a line of text, you could input 60 characters per second at most. Not exactly great for a personal computer. Right. I mean, you could do some text with that. You could do 600 baud equivalent, but you couldn't do graphics. And the Apple One wouldn't do graphics. Um, 
because the Apple One used a TV typewriter that Steve Wozniak had designed. He told me that he hadn't even seen Lancaster's article. And I'll believe him. The guy was good. He was at Atari doing video and stuff, and they had the chips and all that. there. So he designed his own. And for a while, Steve Jobs and Wozniak were thinking about developing a terminal that would work with time sharing because there was a service called Call Computer, which had as their market the computer hobbyists, the timeshare users. And you, would, you could buy time from them at a low rate. Mm -hmm. And so obviously they needed a terminal. Well, they were going to do one, but then the, the ceiling fell in and, and uh, you know, it was time to do a personal computer. So they took the TV typewriter section stuck it onto a board with a generic 6502 circuit there with static memory and, you know, input-output, the regular the stuff you need. And that was their Apple One. So it, in my philosophy, the Apple One was not a personal computer. Because Shots fired. it was limited to that text only. And um, what you needed was what I developed which was direct input to the RAM, random access memory. Yeah, totally. And so I figured this out that, okay, we pro microprocessors are $350. This is 1974. That's too much. So whatever it was, you can't have a microprocessor in it yet. But I had worked out the concept working off of uh, and this is a whole other thing from a philosophical concept of conviviality of design. And I explain it in the book. I don't think I want to explain yes, it now. Yeah, it's in there. So I, I came out with this concept that in order to survive in public operation, a piece of computer equipment must grow a computer club around itself. And it must be designed for that purpose. So that's the challenge I set myself. And from listening to Lancaster's statement that he wants to use newly available random access memory. I started with that and realized, okay, you can have a patch of memory, a memory board, and you can have a board that presents it repetitively with addresses that will match up with the screen scanning, with the raster. Then you have another board that interfaces with that memory, contends with the, the other board, but it, it, the display board has priority. And that will take data coming in off of the serial line or the keyboard and put it in the next location. So it has a counter that knows where the next, next location is. And it presents that as an address to the memory along with the data. And you put the data in the right place so that the automatic action of the display output circuit shows it on the screen in the right place. So that's the modern bitmap kind of thing. Not exactly bitmap, still character mapped, but... A, a character mapped, but... But random access mapped. ROM. So I built up, I designed a circuit, which became the VDM1. But I, I designed, first of all, I did the, the specification design. Didn't know what I hoped it would go into, become a terminal on its own. But it was, it's a terminal designed to grow so that when you could get a microprocessor, you could plug it right onto the bus of that memory, plug in more memory, and you had a computer with its own display. Um, one way of saying that is, I redesigned the terminal so that the computer could walk up the data line and into the terminal and merge with the terminal. That was all theoretical, though. That was on paper. And then the Altair happened. A friend of mine who had convinced me to share a garage with him in Berkeley uh, decided to start a, a computer parts company, processor technology. They would make boards to plug into the Altair because they looked at the article and said, there's nothing in that box. There's no place to plug a teletype in. You know, it needs cards to do that. We'll make the cards. And I helped them, contracted services to teach them engineering and so forth and do some of the engineering and help write the manuals. Then they came to me and said, 
we will pay you to design that terminal you've been designing, the Tom Swift terminal. They used it. Tom Swift was a uh, boy, boy's uh, literature character from the early 1910s. It was really Tom Edison, but a uh, teenage, you know, kid's fantasy, not in, no school, can do whatever he wants and somehow has the money to do it. <clears throat> So Tom Swift is always making Tom Swift's electric, this or that. In my case, it was Tom Swift's electric terminal. So in honor of the character most likely to be found tampering with the equipment, the Tom Swift terminal. So we'll design, we'll pay you to design a Tom Swift terminal, but you have to do it our way. And I was interested, we discussed it, and that became the VDM-1, Video Display Module 1. S100 board that will plug into S100 computers, uh, the Altair and its successors, and produce a video output, which is a window of text on memory. And you could move that video, that text around really fast. And we had mm -hmm. a fellow, Steve Dompier, real genius, yes. who wrote some games. Um, and so he wrote a Trek 80 game. The Trek 73 game was played on a teletype. And it, you would wait while the carriage moved, turn, carriage moved over to the center, chunk, 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 10 characters per second. It printed out a little three line sort of tic tac toe matrix with the enterprise in the middle and a character in each of the nearby places. And then Captain Kirk and, you know, <clears throat> Scotty would be conversing in the con intercom, and uh, it went rather slow. The kids were playing it. Pardon me. Again. Track eighty, on the other hand, had an eight by eight matrix on the screen, which was your map. So Enterprise was at the center, but all sorts of things were happening all around. You know, it, it, kids would love that. You know, and uh, there was the fuel gauge was de decrementing, and it had your your uh, counters and keeping track of your photon torpedoes and there was the intercom text going on and it was, it was also making sound through it with radio they placed next to it because the altar was really noisy in the radio spectrum and Dompier had worked out how to make that into music. He's famous for that, the world's first digital music technically? Not true, no. It, Although it's analog, no, because it's analog. It was, it was actually analog and music had been made on computers previously where they had you know a, a, a bit output to an audio stream this had no output Just, um, oh yes Bill Gates yes, himself wrote nice. in when this was printed and says this is this program is a fraud it has no output statements and how can you output anything without an output statement <laughs> well it worked Bill Gates was a digital guy he was a digital guy in an analog universe and he didn't realize he was limited that way so it's coming out in analog on the radio.